And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. One of the things I like to do in my spare time or when I'm relaxing at home is check out what's on YouTube. And sometimes I'll go there specifically looking for a program, but a lot of times I just kind of look around and see what's on there. And maybe there's something that catches my interest. One time I watched a woman show me how to bake a Mexican cornbread that had been filled with taco meat. It's kind of interesting. Watch a lot of Bob Ross paintings sometimes and a lot of old sports shows that you can't see anywhere else. One time though, something caught my eye and I decided to watch it for a few minutes. It was the first two hours or three hours in the life of a Marine recruit, U.S. Marines. And what the video was, was it showed you what it was like for these new recruits from the moment they stepped on the off the bus at their training base in San Diego and what happened to them over the next couple of hours. And I have to admit, it is quite a sight. There was a lot of screaming and yelling, a lot of breaking people down, and a lot of orders. And when these drill instructors gave orders, they expected them to be obeyed right now. And if you didn't obey them, punishment was swift and severe. And it was in some ways hard to watch because you were looking at a group of people whose lives had changed, for better or for worse. They were in it now with both feet, and they belonged to the U.S. Marines, and they were going to do as they were told. That's the first rule they kind of taught them, that we are going to make you do what we tell you to do. You're going to obey and you should obey every order that you receive. As I got to thinking about it, and thinking about it in the context of our readings this morning, we see two other people here who are confronted with a decision to obey or not. And that, of course, would be Abraham from our Old Testament lesson in Genesis, where God calls him to move, to leave his homeland in Ur and go to the promised land. And then in Matthew, where Jesus is picking his disciples and he tells Matthew, come and follow me. And in both cases, both people, Abraham and Matthew, obeyed immediately. So again, I got to thinking about this and asking myself, especially in the case of Abraham and Matthew, why would people obey? Why would people listen? Why would they go? Not knowing where they're going, not knowing what they're going to do, and in some cases not really knowing why they're going. And as we think about that and how that applies to us this day, I think we can borrow some of the things we know about the military and the Marines and kind of apply them to the same situation. Why would someone go or obey or do what they were told not knowing the how and why and wherefore. The first thing we can say, borrowing from the military, is that they're forced to do it. That in the military, when a superior officer gives you an order, 
and tells you to do something, you do it. You are forced to do it. The weight of the superior office, the authority that that person has, trumps everything else about your decision making. So whether or not you know where you're going or what you're doing or why you're doing it, you simply do it because they have the authority to force you to do it. That's not the same case in our spiritual life. We have made the point that God does not force us to do anything, including responding to him or loving to him. Abraham and Matthew were both in situations where they simply could have said, no, I'm not doing that, but thanks for asking. God was not going to force them to do it. And that is one of the hallmarks, I suppose you could say, of our faith relationship, is that God gives us the freedom to say no to him or to choose to follow or not to follow, even if we make the wrong decision in that regard. We talked a few weeks ago about that great verse in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, 19, where God comes to the Israelites and says, choose this day whether you're going to follow me and receive life and blessings or whether you're going to walk away from me and receive death and curses. So the very idea of choice and of us having a choice should remind us that God is not forcing us into anything, including a relationship with him. So that's first thing. We don't do these things because we're forced to. The second point, and the second way that people can be made to do something or to obey is the threat of punishment. And that's where that video comes back to mind of the Marines in their first few hours. They get off the bus in San Diego and they are confronted with a variety of things that they have to do. In, uh, get your hair cut. Hold your bag a certain way, strip down to your skivvies, dress in this, stand over there. And if you don't do it, you're going to be punished. That is like, I would assume, one of the rules of the military that's right at the top of the list. If you don't do what we tell you to do, there is going to be swift and certain punishment. Now, in a spiritual sense, this also holds to a degree, but it's not a complete fit. We do know that God has promised that he will punish people who disobey him. As just one example, in Colossians 3.25, we read that the wrongdoers will pay for their evil deeds and the things they have done wrong. But, even as God promises that, we know that there are a lot of people in this life who do wrong and do evil and disobey and walk away from God who are not punished. That is a theme that runs throughout the Bible. The righteous and the just and those who choose to follow God often look around them and see a world where evil and injustice and the people who perpetrate them seem to get by okay and seem to be rewarded in some cases. We do know that eventually God will judge and will pay them back, but that's not necessarily in this lifetime. That's in the life ahead, in eternity. So this really isn't a perfect fit for our discussion in terms of getting people to do what you want. 
because I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who are aware of the Bible and that God will punish, and their attitude is, well, bring it on. I'm not going to church. I have no faith. My life seems to be pretty good. Yet, their punishment is coming even if we can't see it yet. So we've got some people who are forced into action and others who do it because of the threat of punishment. And then there's also that group that will do something out of a sense of personal duty and honor. They will obey because their own personal duty, honor, and ethics compel them to do so. Also on YouTube, I was poking around and watching some stuff from that Gettysburg movie that came out about 30 years ago. And it's the last day at Gettysburg, and the decisive battle comes, and they ask General Pickett's division, Confederate division, to march across this open field and go and take this entrenched position that the Yankees had. Well, it was a shooting gallery, and they knew it was going to be a shooting gallery. They were just marching into a hailstorm of bullets being shot from a fortified position. Many of them knew they were going to get shot and killed, and yet they all still went and fought and died out of a sense of personal duty and honor. Again, this does not necessarily work in a spiritual sense because we are not born with a sense of duty and honor. We are born into sin and disobedience. We are born in such a way that makes us run away from the bullets and in the other direction. Jeremiah 17, 9 reminds us that the heart is sick above all things, and for it there is no cure. In other words, we're not born with this idea of personal duty and honor and wanting to obey God. It's not something we're wired with. We are wired to do just the exact opposite to run away, to run in the opposite direction, and to satisfy our own needs and desires. So again, in a spiritual sense, this is not a good fit. So, so far we've got people that are forced to do something. We've got other people who do it out of a threat of punishment, and yet others who will do it out of a threat of personal, out of a sense of personal responsibility and duty. Yet none of these is really a good fit for our spiritual situation, and nor does it explain why Abraham and Matthew did what they did. Which brings us to the fourth point, and this is the real kind of crux of everything we want to think about this morning. And that is, the people that will obey God, that will listen, that will go when he calls, do so, and can only do so out of a sense of faith. Out of a sense of faith, of belief in something greater than them. Going back to Gettysburg uh, and to the Civil War in general, uh, Robert E. Lee, of course, has the reputation as the great general, and such was his stature, and such was his reputation, that his men were willing to go wherever he told them, regardless of the consequences. There's a story about one Confederate soldier that said, I would march into hell itself for that old man. That's a kind of faith, a misplaced faith, but it's a kind of faith. And it is a faith in God, and only in God, that allows us to make the kind of choices that we see Abraham and Matthew making this morning. That's the only way they could have done it. 
is through faith in God, in something greater than themselves. That's the only way it works. Hebrews 11.8 said, in direct reference to Abraham, by faith Abraham was justified. By faith. That's what allowed him to listen to God and to follow God when God told him to do something that seemed completely foreign to him. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know why he was going. And he didn't know why God called him. But he still went because of faith. And it's the same thing for Matthew and the other disciples. Here comes this guy Jesus that Matthew knows very little about. And Jesus comes up to Matthew and says, follow me. And what do we read? Immediately, he left his job as tax collector and followed. It's the same thing with the other disciples. When Jesus approached them, immediately they dropped their fishing nets and followed. Didn't know where they were going, didn't know what they were doing, didn't know how they were going to get there, didn't know much about this Jesus guy at all. But they still went. And they went and they obeyed because of faith. That is what makes the difference. As I was watching some more of that video and talking about it, with some of my Marine friends, including Pastor Randy Wilkin, he said that a lot of Marines drop out. A lot of raw recruits drop out. They simply can't make it. Not because of a lack of physical stamina, and not because of a lack of desire, but rather instead, one of the main reasons they drop out in a way, is because of their lack of faith. They can't obey orders. If someone told them to do something, instead of going and doing it, they would question it. Well, why do you want me to do that? What's the point of that? Why are we doing that? And that kind of attitude simply can't cut it in the military. And you know what? That's why one of the many, many reasons I never went into the military, because I'd be one of those guys. All right, everybody, we're charging up this hill. Why? Why are we doing that? What's the point? Explain it to me, and then maybe I'll think about it, and we can have a discussion, and we'll come to a mutual understanding. And like I said, that kind of attitude just doesn't cut it in the military. We need faith for when God calls us to follow. Because God is still calling each and every one of us to follow him. He stands here today saying the same thing he said to Abraham, the same thing he said to Matthew, come and follow me. And he's looking for people who are willing to take that step and go where he wants them to go, regardless of consequences, regardless of detailed information as to why. He's looking for people willing to faithfully obey. In Isaiah chapter 6, there's that vision Isaiah has of heaven where he sees a glimpse of the glory of heaven. And he feels unworthy to be there because of his sin. So one of the heavenly beings touches his lips with a hot coal and says, now your sins are forgiven. It's a look ahead to how Jesus will remove our sins later. And then he hears this voice, which we presume to be the Lord's, saying, who will go for us? Whom shall we send? And immediately, Isaiah shouts out, Here am I. Send me. 
Isaiah didn't ask who was speaking or why he was called to go or even where he was to go or whatever he was supposed to do. He didn't know any of that. All he knew was that God had called and he was going to answer in faith regardless of the consequences. And I challenge you to think about that today because God is still calling each and every one of us to send us someplace, to do something for the kingdom. We don't know what it is. You may not know what it is or why you're being sent. But our hope and prayer is that you, each one of you, will be able to respond to that call in the same way as Abraham and Matthew and Isaiah. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Amen.